Welcome to worship at First Presbyterian on this Sunday morning. We invite you to sign the friendship pad as it comes down the road. Uh, road, it helps you to get to know who your neighbors are. And also, if you're a visitor, it helps us to make sure that you don't leave here without a warm welcome. And if you'd like our visiting committee to contact you, make it easy for them. Give them your phone number or email, and they'll uh, get in touch with you and uh, give you some information about uh, this very good church. We're all going to gather here uh, next Sunday for worship, and after the, in the 11 o'clock worship service, there will be a congregational meeting for the purpose of electing deacons and elders. The uh, slate of uh, willing and well-qualified uh, elders is, and deacons is in your uh, current issue of First Press. All their pictures are on the, uh, the board in that hallway across from the library. And again, the nominating committee will officially present that slate for election next Sunday in the 11 o'clock service. Big day tomorrow for Presbyterian women, as you can see on the calendar, the Christiana Tea, Big Tea Party. Bring two cans of food along with your $5 for lunch. Prayer service begins at 11.15. You may recognize Ed McLeod back from uh, the celebratory cruise with his wife, who is beyond worth. Um, get Ed whipped back into shape. He's gonna speak at the Early Birds on Wednesday. And at the Wednesday noon service, um, our guest speaker is going to be uh, Nancy Stokes. She's been here before. She is very good. She's one of our commission lay pastors, and she's also the youth minister at Kirk of uh, Kildare. Growing together, got my visual aid for that. This Saturday, you've probably seen these around. You can still register late for this. This is our uh, premier education event in our presbytery, one of the finest in the country, probably. And all our officers are invited to go to that, the incoming uh, deacons and elders as well as anybody else who's interested in getting smarter. If you want to ride the church van, we're going to leave here at 8 o'clock, and if you would park at that end of the parking lot, we have a wedding here this coming Saturday. Andrea Bockel and Isaac Johnson are going to be tying the knot, and some of their guests will be arriving before we come back, so if we can park at that end. Still time to schedule your personal portrait or family photo in the church directory that's upcoming. Kathy Woodson is handling that uh, duty for us all and getting things coordinated and making sure all your information is correct, call Kathy at home, 787-5064 to schedule your time. A little after action report here on those shoes that uh, Don Beckham asked us to bring in from our closets. Turned out to be well over a ton of shoes and a ton of money. Wynn says they collected over five tons of shoes and $2,000 and some uh, for Wynn. And we'll be hosting the Wake Interfaith Hospitality Network the last week in September once again. We have guests with us this morning from Bolivia, Dick and Teresa Alina, Altina, I'm sorry, I get my spelling correctly. They're from Bolivia. They're visiting with folks around here who've been on the mission trip, which uh, Bill Miller has uh, been our shaker and mover of for so many years. Um, and they're going to speak to the youth group tonight. Uh, Dick and Teresa, I saw you here. You want to stand up so people know where you are? Oh, there, there we go. You've seen them before. They spoke to one of our lunches or dinners here. Good to have you with us. Um, they run an orphanage in Santa Cruz for children whose parents are in jail. And in, I'm going to talk about prison ministry here today, but in Bolivia, when the parents go to jail, the children go with them. And, of course, they're very involved in uh, the Eden School, so we, uh, we welcome Dick and Therese Altina to be our guests today. And we welcome you to worship with us.
using the words in the bulletin, let us call ourselves to worship. Praise the Lord who shelters us under comforting wings. Praise the Almighty who is our health and salvation. Praise the Lord who breathed life into each of us. Praise the Lord and glad. Please be seated. Trusting that the mercy of the Lord is from everlasting to everlasting, let us join together in the prayer of confession printed in the bulletin as we gather now in the presence of God at the throne of God's grace, trusting in the mercy of Christ which comes to us freely and a grace that we have not merited, grace that we have not earned, but given to us through Jesus Christ, by God who knows us by name. Let us pray together the prayer. Gracious God, your plan for humanity includes every single person. Jesus modeled inclusion. We practice exclusion. We say we believe in equality and fairness. We read our Gospels where Jesus shows special concern for the poor, the oppressed, but look at our lives and you see exclusion, domination, or at least patronage. Lord, forgive us for withholding the compassion of Christ from those who live beside us. Forgive us for forgetting whose we are and lead us to reconciliation with you and with one another.
What makes the news of the gospel such good news is that Jesus didn't come into the world to condemn us for our failings and our faults. Jesus came into the world to redeem us, to reconcile us to the Father, to heal the rift that is between us and our God and us and our neighbors. Friends in Christ, hear and believe this good news. By the grace of Christ, we have been redeemed, we have been reconciled, we have been forgiven. Thanks be to God. Good morning, first prayers of Raleigh, to Reverend Inski, to the moderator and session and other members or officers and members of this church. My name is John Howard. I'm a member of the board of directors for the Presbyterian Prison Ministry Incorporated for the Raleigh Co um, Correctional Center for <laughs> Women. My purpose for being here this morning is to simply say thank you for your unfailing support for prison ministry at the Raleigh Correctional Center for Women. Several years ago, while serving as chair of the Committee on Mission and Outreach for the Presbytery of Coastal Carolina, I paid a, a visit to PPM, is what we call it sometimes, Presbyterian Prison Ministry, and uh, had a meeting here in, in this church for which we are very grateful for the space that you allow us to have here. 
And I met with the Reverend Marla Cates and the Reverend Dr. Ed Stock. I mention this to you because in meeting with those two people and listening to Dr. Stock, I was clearly blown away and energized uh, by his knowledge and his ability to articulate the various, um, the various community opportunities that exist in and around uh, this church community. In our presbytery, we belong to an internet service called Percept, and uh, it cost us about $8,000 a year to belong to that. And what Percept does is it gives us an opportunity to find out the various entities that are located within our church communities. And I said to myself upon that meeting several years ago that you, as long as you had Ed, didn't need Percept, you had him in here. Um, back to our PPM, we have 17 board members from five different presbyteries that surround us here. We have two full-time employees, the Reverend Caroline Craig Proctor, who is our chaplain and executive director and one administrative officer who are located in this facility. We have three part-time employees who are, are chaplains who serve uh, at the correctional center and give direct services to the uh, inmates there. We have some 100 volunteers who help us out administratively as well as with the inmates at the uh, center. We serve some 700 inmates and of course not at one time they come and go as you, you probably already know, but some 700 receive services uh, and sometimes even more depending upon what the population is. We provide some 14 plus programs for inmates, which includes uh, job starts, Sunday school, um, worship services, and um, counseling um, after release, as well as some housing and, and the like. There are two historic, uh, historical questions that, we are, that are posed to us to answer, and one being, who is our neighbor, and am I my brother's keeper? And there's a third one that I always put with that that somewhat answers those two questions, and it is our neighbor and our brothers are those who show compassion on us. And I would say to you, you have been an epistle of love to Presbyterian ministry, and I'm here to say thank you again and again very much. John, John's a member of Coastal Carolina Presbytery. This is one of the, the only project I know where all five Presbyterians work together on. And for years, he's been saying he wanted to come thank First Presbyterian for our involvement in that. So today, he did. Thank you. I would also like to call forward now our newest member, Brian Lanier, who uh, was, uh, there we go, was greeted by the, uh, welcomed officially by the session this morning. He was going to join our church back in the spring, but that would have necessitated him commuting from Mexico. <laughs> Uh, he was taking a medical Spanish language course there, which he is now using as a volunteer and student at Wake Med, communicating with Hispanic patients. He's a Marine, kind of tell that by looking at him. Still a uh, still member of the uh, Marine Corps Reserve, and he's, uh, as I said, in the process of going to medical school. His home church is Maple Hill Presbyterian, about a half hour north of Wilmington, and his parents, Bert and Phyllis Lanier, are here this morning from Maple Hill. And Brian told me he will never forget the warm welcome he got the first time he visited here from Evelyn Hill and others, some of our great personalities. He's now a key part of the uh, Journey class, and his elder is one of his fellow NC State graduates, uh, Jennifer Ingram. So please uh, greet or salute Brian Lanier after our worship service today as our newest member. Congratulations. At this time, I'd like to call Amy Veach and Sarah Finnerty up here I'm with me, and we will join in a service of dedication for educational leadership here at First Presbyterian. There's an insert in your bulletin if you will follow along with us.
as educational volunteers, let's have everyone stand. I had to do the last service. Um, have everyone who is teaching, everyone who is <laughs> teaching. Okay. Um, I'd like to, everyone who's teaching, either in preschool, elementary, youth, or adult, working with Pathfinders, working with Youth Fellowship, teaching Bible study, all our educational leaders to please stand. And we'll get off to a better start here. <laughs> As educational volunteers, you have been called into positions of special leadership. Will you therefore, in the presence of this congregation, promise to be faithful in your church relationship, participating regularly in the worship and fellowship of the church, and in giving leadership to the programs in which you serve. We will be faithful. Will you give your time, skills, and energy in such a way as will demonstrate your dedication to Christ and his kingdom? We will give. Will you prepare and carefully, will you prepare carefully by studying your Bible, curriculum materials, and other resources that, as workers approved unto God, you may lead persons to know God more fully and to respond to God in faith and love. We will, we will prepare. prepare. Will you pray and seek God's help in this noble task of the church? We will pray. Do you now pledge your best efforts in our Christian education programs by which we should proclaim the good news of God as revealed in Jesus Christ? We will do our best as Christian education leaders during this year before us. And now I'd like to ask the rest of the congregation to stand, please. And if you'll join in this responsive reading for the congregation. Do you stand in faithful partnership with our Christian education staff and volunteers? We, members of the congregation and the members of Christ, stand in support of our Christian education leaders. How do you propose to support these servants? We will support them through faithful attendance, through words of appreciation and encouragement, and especially through our prayers. Teachers of children share a great responsibility of molding lives according to principles defined in God's holy word. Who will share in this responsibility? We, the parents and friends of our children, will strive to teach by example Christian lives devoted to love and service for Christ. We will try to instill in them respect for their teachers and for the values taught in church school and pathfinders. Teachers and leaders of youth face a great challenge. Who will help them mature in Christ and respond to the call of servanthood? We, the parents and friends of our youth, will strive to provide the kind of environment that protects God's love from every corner. All of us need strength to face daily challenges and problems. How will you make Christian education at First Presbyterian a meaningful experience for yourselves and others? We will help by encouraging and supporting one another in Christian fellowship. We will seek to learn by listening, studying, responding, and contributing to each other's learning by sharing thoughts, ideas, and experiences. Let us pray together. O oh God, giver of knowledge, we have made our promises to you and to one another. Help us to remember them and to keep them. Remind us that we are to support, not judge one another in this task. Create in us open hearts and minds as teachers, leaders, and learners so that we may accept your spirit as it comes and prepare ourselves as living sacrifices of your service. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. You may be seated. I'd like to call your attention to some of the pastoral concerns in the congregation. 
Um, Laird Holder is at Wake Med. He had a stroke and was hospitalized yesterday. Cynthia Skidmore is at Rex. Ann Lambert is at Rex Rehab. George Marsh is at Wake Med. And Betty Crawford is at the hospital in Smithfield. Margaret Farrell had surgery on Friday. Our sympathy is extended to the family of Inez Adams, who passed away on the 9th of September, and that service was held September 11th at Mitchell Funeral Home. Inez was mother of Jean Nichols and Ann Allred, grandmother of Jim Nichols and Cindy Elderkin, and great-grandmother of many others in our congregation. Let us look to God in a time of prayer. Gracious God, we rejoice this day in your goodness to us and your abundant blessings. We thank you for our beautiful world, for sunshine and blue skies, for the green grass, shrubs, and trees, for flowering plants, wildlife, and animals, for fruits and vegetables that nourish us and keep us healthy. For all your creative gifts of nature, we praise and thank you. Yet, great God, we know that there are places in our world, places like Texas and Louisiana and the Caribbean, where storms have ravished the earth, where winds have blown away roofs and destroyed homes, where waves have destroyed the coastlines, and rains have flooded communities, destroying crops and businesses. Please be with those who suffer losses at the hands of natural disasters, for the loss of loved ones, friends, and animals, for the loss of livelihood and displacement of people and families. We pray your comforting presence on these people and all the victims of tragedies of all kinds. We also ask your blessing upon rescue workers and healthcare workers, for firefighters and military leaders, for volunteers of all kinds, who help comfort the suffering, and who provide relief in time of need. Great God, we thank you for the gift of your Son, Jesus Christ, who taught us how to love one another and care for our neighbors, who was willing to die on our behalf that we might have the forgiveness of sins and the promise of eternal life. Help us forgive others so we also, as we also have been forgiven. Hear now our prayers together as we pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debts. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, I invite all the children to come up. How are you all this morning? You good? You want to sit right there? Okay. Everybody's up here almost. Only one more to come. There she comes. There's a lot of you sitting up here. It's really wonderful to see you all this morning. You may know that I'm Amy Veach, and I'm the Director of Youth and Young Adult Ministry here. And sitting up here with us is Sarah Johnson. And she's a sophomore in high school. She goes to Raleigh Charter School here in Raleigh. And she and I have been on several trips together. 
We've been on trips to do mission. We've been on trips for youth conferences where we just talk about God mainly. And we've done all kinds of things together. But I thought that you all might like to get to know her a little bit more. So I'm going to ask her a few questions, okay? So Sarah, what, what are some of your favorite foods? What's one of your favorite foods? Well, some of my favorite snack things are, um, I love to drink milk with ice in it and eat popcorn at the same time. Ew, that's just nasty. That's really gross. Ugh. I don't think Sarah likes my choice for snacks. That's too bad, because it's really good to eat, and I'd love for her to share that with me sometime, but she doesn't have to. Um, but that's just one example of things that we don't have in common. I, I like spinach, it's okay, but I really like milk with ice in it and popcorn together much better than I like spinach. And I'm sure that Sarah likes spinach much better than my choices. But I want you all to understand that God gives us these differences on purpose because I'm sure there's someone out there who loves spinach as much as Sarah does and there might be a few who like milk with ice in it and popcorn, but I don't know. But anyway, Sarah and I have been able to overcome these differences that we might have and work together and experience God's love together. So Sarah has a prayer for us now. Can you pray? Dear God, thank you for making all of us different, and thank you for helping us get along with our friends through your love. Amen. lead you to children's worship now. Or you can go back with your families. Let us bow our heads for our prayer for illumination. Almighty God, in you are hidden all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. Open our eyes that we may see the wonders of your word and give us grace that we may clearly understand and freely choose the way of your wisdom. Through Jesus Christ our Lord, amen. Our scripture lesson for today comes from the book of Romans, chapter 14, verses 1 through 12. Let us hear the word of the Lord. Welcome those who are weak in faith, but not for the purpose of quarreling over opinions. Some believe in eating anything, while the weak eat only vegetables. Those who eat must not despise those who abstain, and those who abstain must not pass judgment on those who eat for God has welcomed them. Who are you to pass judgment on servants of another? It is before their own Lord that they stand or fall, and they will be upheld, for the Lord is able to make them stand. Some judge one day to be better than another, while others judge all days to be alike. Let all be fully convinced in their own minds. Those who observe the day, observe in honor of the Lord, and those who eat, eat in honor of the Lord, since they gave thanks to God, while those who abstain, abstain in honor of the Lord and give thanks to God. We do not live to ourselves, and we do not die to ourselves. If we live, we live to the Lord, and if we die, we die to the Lord. So then, whether we live or whether we die, we are the Lord's. For to this end Christ died and lived again, so that he might be Lord of both the dead and the living. Why do you pass judgment on your brother or sister? Or you, why do you despise your brother or sister? For we will all stand before the judgment seat of God. For it is written, as I live, says the Lord, every knee shall bow to me, and every tongue shall give praise to God. So then each of us will be accountable to God. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God.
New Testament reading continues in the Gospel of Matthew, chapter 18. Peter came to Jesus and said, Lord, if another member of the church sins against me, how often should I forgive? The rabbinical idea was three times. Peter thought he was going to go way beyond that, and he said, as many as seven times? Jesus said to him, not seven times, but I tell you 77 times, or 70 times seven. For this reason, the kingdom of heaven may be compared to a king who wished to settle accounts with his slaves. When he began the reckoning, one who owed him 10,000 talents was brought to him. And as he could not pay, his Lord ordered him to be sold, together with his wife and children and all his possessions and payment to be made. So the slave fell on his knees before him saying, have patience with me and I will pay you everything. And out of pity for him, the Lord of that slave released him and forgave him the debt. But that same slave, as he went out, came upon one of his fellow slaves who owed him a hundred denarii, and seizing him by the throat, he said, pay what you owe. Then his fellow slave fell down and pleaded with him, have patience with me and I will pay you. But he refused. And then he went and threw him into prison until he would, not, until he would pay the debt. When his fellow slaves saw what had happened, they were greatly distressed, and they went and reported to their Lord all that had taken place. Then his Lord summoned him and said to him, You wicked slave, I forgave you all that debt because you pleaded with me. Should you not have had mercy on your fellow slave as I had mercy on you? And in anger, his Lord handed him over to be tortured until he would pay his entire debt. So my heavenly Father will also do to every one of you if you do not forgive your brother or sister from your heart. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. <clears throat> if a brother offends you, the onus is on you to extend the olive branch, to work out forgiveness. So that put the onus on Ken Lucas. The offense had come from Steve Smith. Smith slugged Lucas while Lucas was resting on one knee on the sideline of the Carolina Panthers practice field, where he's a famous football player like Tyler. Hit him when he was down. Lucas had to have surgery. Now you may be saying, who cares? These are two guys who get paid lots of money to be as violent as they can to others, all in the name of sport. Or perhaps you're like me, and you're a lifelong Redskins fan, and you don't care if two Carolina Panthers kiss and make up or not. But I was real intrigued by what Ken Lucas did. He was the guy who got slugged. Turns out he and Smith had had difficulties getting along for a long time. Smith is a fiery person. They've had what Lucas called a personality conflict for four years. Now, how motivated would you be to make nice with somebody who had been a jerk for four years? Nobody really likes him anyway. And everybody in the whole world knows he took a cheap shot, slugged you twice while you were down for no reason, got suspended from the team. But you know what Ken Lucas said? He said, I go to Bible study just like he does every week. For me not to be able to forgive him then I'd just be wasting my time going to Bible study. So Ken extended the right hand of fellowship and genuine forgiveness. He said, it was 100 degrees out there. You're sweaty, you're tired, you're frustrated. Sometimes emotions get involved. We're both ultra competitors who hate losing. He expects to catch every ball, I expect to defend every ball. And so as dozens of sports reporters with microphones and cameras surrounded Ken Lucas, they heard a remarkable example of forgiveness. As sports columnist for the News and Observer, Tom Sorensen wrote, we talk endlessly about how tough athletes are. How many are tough enough to forgive a coworker who takes them out with a cheap shot? Let the record show, Bible study took with Ken Lucas. Ken Lucas could forgive. Interestingly, Steve Smith says he can't forgive himself. 
Today I'm going to talk about prison ministry. I know something about it from working with my colleague John Howard here on the board for Presbyterian Prison Ministry. I've worked with all 16 of our Job Start classes here at First Presbyterian. And I've seen the growing investment in time, talent, and money in this vital ministry that our church is committed to. So what does forgiveness have to do with that? Well, I'm not sure the female offender at Raleigh Correctional Center for Women feels as if she needs your forgiveness. Although I imagine many of them are like Steve Smith and can't forgive themselves. Many of them have children and are racked with guilt over their failure to be present with their children. The reason I mention forgiveness is that I figure that might be the only reason that you would not want to extend a, a helping hand to help these women get back on their feet. If you're reluctant to forgive an inmate because she violated the rules of polite society, if you're unable to forgive her for being of less good character than you, perhaps being unrepentant for wanting to rise above where you think she is, if it's hard to forgive her for not being grateful for all you're doing for her, for not doing church like you do church, if you can't forgive her for not wanting your forgiveness, then are you a person who goes to Bible study but you're just wasting your time, in the words of Ken Lucas? If you're reluctant to be a forgiving Christian, are you cutting yourself off from being a member of the community of those who do forgive as God has so freely forgiven us? Are you standing outside the family of God, outside the circle of forgiveness? Well, my message to you about prison ministry today fortunately doesn't depend upon your willingness to forgive others. You don't even have to be a Christian. You may be perfect in every way, free from sin, and you're only here for the coffee and the donuts. <clears throat> but what I'm going to tell you is in your best interest. Even if you don't care about these women, even if you don't give a flip about Jesus' teaching, in no uncertain terms about doing justice and loving kindness and loving our neighbor, even those who are sick or in prison. Just let me give you this one thought to chew on. That woman at Raleigh Correctional Center, the one who's had a much rougher life than you, she's about 35, been in prison about seven years. She doesn't make good decisions like you do, doesn't have your level of education, doesn't have your work skills, doesn't have your network of family and friends, or the one she has, you probably wish she didn't, that woman is getting out. 95% of those convicted of felonies in the state of North Carolina will be released. Your question is, would you rather she be released as a better citizen or a better criminal? Are you hoping she'll fall back into whatever pattern she was in in the first place so there are a few more victims, the cost of law enforcement arresting her, the cost of a trial, putting her back into prison, for a few more years at a cost of about 30000 a year to feed her, clothe her, and to provide medical care. Even if you don't care about her as a person or a fellow Christian, probably a victim herself, at least in part, even if you don't really care about her, what do you suppose is in the best interest of society? To have her as a contributing member of society as a better person or to live among us as a better criminal? The superintendent at Raleigh Correctional Center for Women, Kenneth Royster, is one fine man. He felt the call to some sort of public service when he was stationed at Fort Bragg when he was in the Army. He initially thought about being a firefighter, but then somehow he got into uh, law enforcement and somehow this uh, being a correctional officer appealed to him. And so he started as a correctional officer in 1988 for about 18000 a year. But he has found his niche. He cares about these women. He believes they could become better people, productive citizens, if only they could just get the message, if the light bulb would just go on. And he said some of them have been there for 10 years now, and the light bulb still hasn't gone on. Because she's not likely to accept any help from any authority figure. Most likely she was abused by authority figures in her past. And she's on guard against anybody who works for the Department of Correction. But he said a mentor a woman from the community who's only there because she cares about the inmate, maybe for the first time in that inmate's life, someone's showing her some interest, some respect, some Christian love, maybe she'll listen to that person. Maybe she'll listen to you. Maybe she'll believe that you really care. Well, she will be getting out. 
Will she join the vast majority of those former inmates who return? 66% of all who are released are back within three years. What a waste of your money. What a waste of humanity. And what a burden to bear for this 35-year-old woman, mother of three, who's been locked up, as they say, for five to ten years. We Presbyterians believe that God has given each of us a unique set of gifts, and there's a unique niche in this world where we're needed to build God's kingdom. Is that the niche God has for that woman? She made a mistake. She made a bad decision. She admits it. She had turned away from God, turned away from family, probably burned a lot of bridges. But tomorrow she finishes her sentence. They'll open the door, she'll walk out of Raleigh Correctional Center for Women onto State Street with maybe $50 in her pocket. How far would you get? Oh, maybe if she's on work release, like one of the four or five who have been here at the church on work release, in case you didn't know, Maybe if she was smart enough to save some of that modest money she made, if she's a good money manager, she might have a little more, but imagine yourself stepping out onto State Street with $50 in your pocket. How far do you suppose you'd get? When you walk out that door into a world that's changed dramatically since you were last on the street, you go from a world where every decision is made for you, where food is provided and where the lights are on and the plumbing works, and you go from that into what? Your job prospects are slim, housing options are severely limited. And how do you get from that marginal housing to your entry-level job? Take the bus? Oh, where do you buy bus tickets? What are the bus schedules? Does the bus go anywhere from where you live to where you work? How much time does it take to get to that job? How many hours a day? And so you wake up one morning in a panic. You knew how to cope in the prison, but this world is overwhelming to you. The commode's backing up. You don't know who to call. You have no friends or family. What do you do? What do you do? How far did you get on that $50? You may have read an article in the Sunday paper back in July about how critical community support is for ex-offenders. The article began, fresh out of prison, Angela Covington stared into her mother's refrigerator, unable to decide what to eat, and she started crying. She was used to others telling her what to do. At a job interview, all was going well until the conversation turned to her criminal record. She didn't get the job. The main challenge for the Department of Correction and our main thrust now as uh, Presbyterian Prison Ministry is transitional care, helping these women re-enter society. The director of chaplaincy services for DOC, whom we work with, Betty Brown, was quoted in the article as saying, when they get home, they need to be released into an environment that will receive them in forgiveness, reconciliation, and to affirm that you did your crime, you did your time, let's move forward. Now we know we're gonna have failures. We've already had some, even in the Job Start program, and it breaks your heart. But what if a woman who's feeling hopeless, who's maybe never been given any serious shot at success before, gets accepted in the Job Start program, is assigned a mentor, possibly a woman from this church, who can be the one whom she will come to trust, to listen to, to learn from, what might be possible. Before release, she went out with you on a weekend pass to Walmart, and you spent time learning how the buses work. And then when she's out, she wakes up one morning in a panic with no one to call. But wait, she can call you. And she survives the crisis. She has one more shot at being among the 33% who make it. As a contributing member of society, as a good worker, a good person, a good mom, daughter, Christian. One of our Job Start graduates, whom I get to see pretty regularly, uh, was on work release uh, initially for a restaurateur by the name of Gypsy, who employs several work release women at her restaurant. It's good business. They're good servers. When Mabel was about to be released, Gypsy gave her the best vote of confidence she could. She said she would like her to continue to work there in the restaurant. She handles the money, by the way. 
She helped Mabel to get a place to stay. It's in the apartment of a, of a family's home. Helped her get a car. And the day she got out, Gypsy told her, take as much time off as you need to get readjusted. So Mabel stayed out for 10 days. Surprised to learn it was 10 days with pay. It's a win-win situation. It's actually a win-win-win 70 times seven situation. We have volunteers. We have computers. We have the good news of Jesus Christ. We're the face of hope, of new beginnings new possibilities. We don't judge, we don't abuse, we aren't unforgiving, we care, we respect, we're a lifeline if we choose to be. If we think that's what Jesus meant by love your neighbor, forgive the one who wronged you, and forgive again and again. Our Presbyterian prison ministry has been blessed with some great chaplains. As John said, Marla Cates, member of First Presbyterian served for six to eight years. She was quite a visionary. She helped launch the Job Start program, which is one of the most successful, successful in the state, by the way, largely because they meet off-site instead of at the prison. The building, uh, 124 building, is dedicated entirely to Job Start at this time. Our present chaplain, Caroline Proctor, has gotten us well organized and has a, a vision of where we can be, providing more and more transitional care as well as providing good pastoral care at the Hope Center, which was built by our friends at White Memorial Presbyterian. And we were blessed this summer by a brilliant intern from Duke Divinity School, Lauren Hayes, who is on the order of Elizabeth Coddington, brilliant and also with this heart for ministry. Perhaps you can see from her writing what she saw at Raleigh Correctional Center for Women. And much of this is from her blogs, which you can access on the Duke Divinity website. Lauren started a Bible study. It would be different from any kind of Bible study they'd had before. They would study the marginalized women in Scripture, people such as Hagar, Jephthah's daughter, and Tamar. And instead of Lauren interpreting the text for them, in this Bible study, everyone's voice would be honored. The, each woman would be invited to put herself into the biblical text and try to discover how God saw them, heard them, and was present with them in the midst of their suffering, their abuse, their marginalization. I'm reading from Lauren's blog now. The third week, when we talked about the rape of Tamar by her very own brother, the women shared their personal stories of abuse and rape and how they could relate to Tamar. One woman told us of how she just barely avoided being raped by hiding in a closet. Like I had imagined, these texts brought up painful experiences for these women in their own lives. When I asked what they thought about David's son, Absalom, killing Amnon for raping their sister Tamar, one woman told me she thought Amnon got what he deserved and that people like him should be killed. I think our intern, Lauren, did a masterful job of helping these women see that the abuse in their background was not some punishment from God. And as Lauren wrote, maybe in hearing the voices of these women in Scripture, they can discover their own value and worth as daughters of God. When I see people called to ministry like Lauren and Caroline, Superintendent Kenneth Royster, when I remember the dedication of our own Mary Ray who held us together when we were just about to fall apart, I take heart and I have hope. But I just can't get that other image out of my mind. What if that were me coming through that door, Raleigh Correctional Center for Women, stepping out onto State Street with $50 in my pocket? How far would I get? I'm not as strong as some of those women. I'm afraid I would grab hold of the first hand that reached out to me. Would it be the hand of a neighbor, someone sent by God? Or would it be the hand that pulled me back down whence I came? In a moment, we're about to sing this great Spanish hymn, When a Poor One, and I hope you'll let the word speak to you. When a poor one who has nothing shares with strangers, when the crippled in their weakness strengthen others, then we know that God still goes that road with us. 
When we love, though hate at times seems all around us, when each stranger that we meet is called a neighbor, then we know that God still goes that road with us. May God go that road with us, and may we be good neighbors. In appreciation for your focusing on the words of this song, you may remain seated. And partly because of, due to the translation, the translation and the music gets funny at some places. So I'm going to sing the verses if you'll sing the, the chorus. Um, and Craig will be playing the organ during the chorus. Nothing shares with strangers When the thirsty water gives unto us all When the cripple in their weakness strengthens others Then we know that God still goes that road with us Then we know that God still goes that road At last all those who suffer find their comfort When they hope, though even hope seems hopelessness When they love, though hate at times seems all around us Then we know that God still goes that road with us Then we know that God still goes that road When our joy fills up our cup to overflowing, when our lips can speak no words other than true, when we know that love for simple things is better, then we know that God still goes that road with us, then we know that God still goes that road When our homes are filled with goodness in abundance, when we learn how to make peace instead of war, when each stranger that we meet is called a neighbor, then we know that God still goes that road with us. Then we know that God still goes that road. We've come to the time of the service when we make our affirmation of faith. We're using words taken from the Confession of 1967. Let me just set this in context a bit because we don't often use this one of our confessional documents. Many of you will remember that the 1960s in this country was a particularly turbulent time of social unrest and upheaval. There was a push for civil rights and a push back against civil rights. We were embroiled in a difficult and complicated war. College campuses were places of rioting and violence and protest. And internationally, we were in what was called the Cold War. Uh, I didn't really understand what the Cold War was in the early 60s. I was a child at the time, but I did know two things. One is that the doctor who lived on our street had a bomb shelter built in his backyard. That made an impression on me. The second is that in our elementary school, we were trained at what to do if 
bombs were sent our way, we were to get under our desks with our heads under our hands in the naive assumption that that would matter. The 60s were a time of great upheaval and uncertainty, a lot of mistrust, a lot of pulling apart. The Presbyterian Church felt a need to say something to speak a word into this context. And what they said came out as the Confession of 1967. It's a word about reconciliation. It said what was true then and is true now, that the hope of the world is Jesus Christ. That if there is to be reconciliation in our world, if there is to be redemption in our world, it will come as a result of the work of Christ. And so today we use as part of our, or, or as our affirmation of faith, a few sentences from the Confession of 67. A confession that calls us to trust and believe that Christ came into the world to reconcile the world to God. And so as, as people who believe that still to be true, let us stand together and affirm what we believe. In Jesus Christ, God was reconciling the world to himself. Jesus Christ is God with humanity. He is the eternal Son of the Father, who became human and lived among us to fulfill the work of reconciliation. He is present in the church by the power of the Holy Spirit to continue and complete his mission. This work of God the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit is the foundation of all confessional statements about God, humanity, and the world. Therefore, the church calls all people to be reconciled to God and to one another. Amen. Please be seated. And now in response to the reconciling love of God, let us present to God God's tithes and our offerings.
let us pray. Lord God of grace, you have richly blessed us, and so we stand before you as your grateful people. Accept the offerings we bring. Receive them as an act of worship as we place ourselves before your throne of grace as a living sacrifice as we place ourselves in your service for your glory, for your kingdom, world without end. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. May God indeed take us by the hand so we can extend that hand to the stranger whom we call neighbor. May God continue to bless us and enable us to do justice, love kindness, and walk humbly with our God this day and forevermore. Amen. Amen.